Let us pray. Loving God, you give us your word, you give us one another, and you give us your spirit. And so together, let us hear your word for us this day. Amen. When I was in second grade, uh, my art teacher gave each of us a lump of clay and invited us, the creative instruction, to make a duck. Obviously, I'm not an artist, but I am obedient. And so, I made a duck. A duck that only a mother could love. And out of our great love, out of God's great love for humanity, perhaps the creator and maker of heaven and earth had me in mind when he gave the second commandment about making images, graven images. God is not against us making stuff. Far from it, our creation story is about God taking stuff and creating a benevolent and sustaining order for us, but also with us. The Lord breathed life into dust, but God did not create us with stones for hearts, although some might argue rocks in our heads. God said, let us make humankind in our image and according to our likeness. And so here we are. God created us sensual and sensate creatures with visions and experiences of the creation around us, with gifts to create great stuff from stuff. In an infinite variety of ways, we do delight in recreating the creation around us. Words and music, arts and sciences, our bodies and our minds, for our eyes, for our ears, taste, smell, and touch, and for our souls. The Lord gave dominion in his creation to us. Dominus, Lord. The Lord made us lords. And so let me ask you, one Lord to another, how do you think we're doing at this lording it over creation business? We got off to a rocky start. These Ten Commandments were not the first ones that God gave us. And if past is prologue, we are not very good at listening to or taking instructions from our wisest counselor. Thou should not, shalt not eat from the tree that will satisfy your hunger to be all-knowing. God gave us what we needed, but apparently not what we wanted. God's handiwork was not enough for us. Being in the image and likeness of God was not enough to satisfy us. And so what did we do? We ate the fruit. But the hunger pangs, that hunger to be all-knowing, still gnaws away inside us. We are created in the image and likeness of God, to be part of the Lord's work, ongoing work of creating God's benevolent and sustaining order. To seek wisdom and understanding with the gifts that God has given us. But we still hunger to grasp the ungraspable and to define and control the creation that God has placed in our care, to know and show to control the mystery of how God will be known and shown. It's a curious craving. If we believe that in Jesus God walked among us, the word made flesh, if we believe in the incarnation and still hunger for making our own images and idols, that speaks to a very, very deep and profound hunger. And this is not some kind of theological abstraction. The one in whose image we are made knows this hunger with which we struggle. And so God has given us tangible ways to experience the presence of the steadfast love from which we are created. God's word for hearts to hear. Bread and wine we can taste and eat and smell. 
and water we can feel. Every baptism is a sacred mystery, a first step that begins with life-giving water that we can feel. I invite you after worship to join Mrs. Burt to talk about baptism. She's over, we'll be over in McNaughton Hall. After worship today, Hannah will be right here and she will feel that water in her baptism. That will be her welcome into a fellowship that is thousands of years old. And what do we call this fellowship? The body of Christ, created to be tangible, a living embodiment of the steadfast love from which we are created. God's earliest charge to us was to be fruitful and multiply, to recreate humanity, to carry on God's sacred living image and likeness into the world. And our sacred calling is to open God's children's hearts to the surprising truth that every child young or not so young, is made in the image and likeness of God who loves us. And then together, to get to know the living, loving God whose image we carry. So I ask you, how do we do that? How do we do that? Human images, human metaphors can be fraught with peril. God, our loving parent, what if your fully fallible parents failed you, or worse, hurt you? The righteous judge. What if you've suffered injustice? What if you have never experienced mercy or forgiveness? An old man with a beard? For David Walstead out there, I have nothing against venerable gents with facial hair. My father was one of them, but I think we can do better than that. There are beautiful metaphors in scripture. God sheltering us like a mother eagle with her chicks under her wing. In this week's Nurturing Faith video, Mrs. Burt told us about Jesus, giving us a way to help us understand what it's like for us to grow in God's love. And Jesus gave us an image that Jesus is that deeply rooted, strong vine. And all of us are the branches and flowers that grow out for that into something beautiful and strong to share God's love. Our pergola helps us think of that every time we look at it. But the challenges in this commandment, thousands of years old, are alive and well. We are not so different from the ancient Israelites. We are surrounded by self-created, stone-dead idols enticing us to worship and serve them. My Old Testament professor, Patrick Miller, said, making an image of God is like playing with fire. The images we make for God reveal actually more about ourselves than they do about God. They reveal our experiences, cruelty and tenderness, our needs, our desires, our anxiety. It's all about us. And then we whittle the mystery of the one in whose image we are made down to our size. Then we turn our creative image maker energies on ourselves, and then even worse, on the people around us. We make idols of our work, we make idols of our words, we make absurd caricatures of our adversaries and then chisel them in stone. We carve images of ourselves from self-referential, distorted images of God. Then we carve out our places, we carve out our positions, and then we consecrate them in the name of all that we declare holy. We strip the image and likeness of God of its sacred scope and its gracious freedom. When we say God's name, it should be with our spirits doing this. Then we offer up carefully selected images captured with a narrow focus lens projected onto a small screen to increasingly stone-hearted viewers. Stone by stone by stone we build walls that disguise and hide the face of God. There is a beautiful poem 
by Rainer Maria Rilke, and I want to share it with you. We must not portray you in king's robes, you drifting mist that brought forth the morning. Once again, from old paint boxes, we take the same gold for scepter and crown that has disguised you through the ages. And piously, we produce our images of you until they stand around you like a thousand walls. And when our hearts would simply open, our fervent hands hide you. The good news is God forgives that. The good news is that forgiveness offers us an exodus. Freedom from the bondage to the puny, self-created images of God we create. And free us to become iconoclasts of ossified minds and rock-hard hearts. This word for us is more than a prohibition about carving statues of little gods. It's a safeguard against the hubris that believes that we can define or limit the limitless grace of God. If we could believe we can do that to God, how much more likely are we to do that to ourselves and then worse, to the people around us? The challenges of this commandment are alive and well. The children of God are drowning in images. And images have a memorable impact on us. Some of them very, very painful. Some of them heal us and renew us because we see before we understand. And my friends, our children are watching. Every day, in great and small ways, we make our marks with our thoughts, with our words, with our hands, and with our silver and gold. What images are we creating? What are we etching in the hearts and minds of God's children? And how can we help one another discover for ourselves and then embody for one another the likeness of the divine breath that is within each one of us? This word today is a command. Thou shalt not chisel thy God or thyself in stone. Instead, we offer ourselves to the potter who creates us with loving hands. Why would we want any other gods? Why do we create our own? We are the desire of God's heart and longing. We are loved. And with love and delight, God created us out of dust. But God didn't carve us into stone. God blessed us with infinite variety, delight and frustrations and longings of our own and, my friends, freedom. The potter who created us and calls us good did not call us perfect. The image of God in us is not perfection. Perfection worships itself and turns our hearts inward. We are created and blessed with the transforming love of our potter, whose love for us was so zealous, so jealous, that instead of demanding sacrifices from us, emptied himself of glory and became the sacrifice for the crooked pots, the broken vessels, the dunderheaded disciples, and my friends for us. This word is much less about art and more about hearts. About God wanting to be first in our hearts and then about our embodying that steadfast love in our living. God gave these words in the midst of the Exodus and it began with a reminder, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The living God freed the Israelites and frees us from bondage, and leads us through the wilderness with steadfast love and faithfulness. Why? In order for us to live in faithful freedom with all our imperfections. But my friends, it's not enough to be free. We must become fully human. 
the living likeness of God's steadfast love and mercy and faithfulness. And so I invite us together. Let us discover how to nurture that sacred likeness, that likeness and image of our maker. And then within ourselves, allow it to become fruitful and multiply within you, within me, between us. And then we take that into the world and everything will change. Amen.